Ciao Lu, welcome. Um, your film, uh, uh, Voice Late at Night, Voices of Ordinary Madness, was just shown. This is part of a trilogy, um, the Tomorrow trilogy. Did you set out from the start to, to make it a trilogy? And could you tell us something of the, the background, what it's about, and mm. for instance, what is the third part going to be? Yeah, um, the first film called Once Upon a Time Proletarian, and it's a documentary, very fragmented, 15 chapters documentary about China, the street people, the lower class in China. So that film I made without thinking I might have a continuation of, of mm. that subject. Uh, so that was four years ago. And this film was produced for the last two or three years because I collected the footage for some years uh, in London, in England. Um, so when, when I had all this footage and I thought it's so similar, the subject and the style is so similar from what I have done um, with the previous documentary. Um, so this one, when I was shooting, I already know there will be more than 10 chapters because the characters are so fragmented. Um, each character, like passing, they don't, they don't stay and they, they couldn't be captured after the, after the filming uh, because they are the random people I met. Mm -hmm. um, and then I thought also I need a kind of link, a fictional link in, the, in the each chapter to link to each character. And that was kind of quite similar of my previous documentary. So in a way, I, I, I thought, okay, it's like writing an essay. You know, you, you write a continued essay in terms of the same subject, yeah. And perhaps the third one, I shouldn't say before I ever make it, but it was to do with future, our future. Yeah. yeah. And the first one was filmed in China. We should, we should say that. Yeah. It was, yeah. yeah. But that, then you had a more structured view of what you wanted, what you wanted to do? Um, I'm always kind of, a, I'm kind of like a formalist because I like the idea to, to have this quite rigid format mm -hmm. um, when I already know the subject, although I haven't... Normally, I, I wouldn't know exactly the footage would be like, but I'm very kind of idea-driven filmmaker, so I wouldn't do a film just randomly because I got some footage. So I have some certain kind of intellectual idea what I want to say, and then I will have a certain format to go with the idea. Um, I know it will be fragmented. I know it will be more than 10 little kind of interval with a fictional element. And then I go along with all the footage, but but then the whole frame is there for me to, to do, yeah. Yeah. Um, for the people who haven't seen the film, maybe I should explain that um, you talk to random people in London and also in Glasgow, I understand. Yeah. For, yeah. yeah. And um, maybe I should uh, have a quick um, kind of um, summary for, for, yeah. the, for the story, okay. just in case. Um, and it's a film's kind of like study of the underclass society in Britain nowadays. Uh, so you, you, you see quite, quite a lot of characters, but very short, uh, brief encounters with those street people, with tramps, with lots of working class people in England and in Scotland. But now the final, final film, you see very little Scottish people or Welsh. You mainly see Londoner or Eng English and as an immigrant basically in London. Yeah. yeah. And, but also a banker, you talk to a banker. Yeah, yeah. Um, and somehow there, there comes this feeling that's, I mean, it's not very explicit, but, it, but it, it, it's also very explicit. I mean, it's beautifully contradictory in a way. Uh, about capitalist society, about our, the structure of our society, the way we work, the, the future also you feel um, of, of working in the West. Was that something that came out of those conversations? I mean, when you started to talk to people, were these interviews structured or did you just like a free floating uh, conversation? Yeah, it's, it's, it's free, it was free. Because um, lots of characters are really street people, vulnerable people. Um, some characters you, you already saw, they went to prison many years and they have serious drug problem. And some characters are quite menacing for me too. It's, it's kind of dangerous. So you have this very fractured relationship with street people because you don't really belong to them. Mm. And, um, but yet you try to make a film, make a dialogue with them in a, in a kind of equal platform. But it's very, um, I think it's very difficult to position how you make them to speak. 
um, and also they they can be only very personal with you. There's no other form. They wouldn't be very politically correct. They wouldn't care um, some kind of you know hidden story because they they really they are proletarian. Mm. They own nothing, so they they tell stories quite sensitive. Quite it could be quite dangerous for them too. But again, they didn't care. Um, why 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 could and it be I think why could it be dangerous? Um, sorry. I think they have this very gangster. I mean, some of the characters are, really have this gangster quality. Uh, for example, one of the characters in the film who went to prison and who has quite tough life, um, and he's one of the gangsters around East London. So it's, it's kind of um, unpredictable. Um, you have a little camera, and you let a conversation with them. And some stuff they're telling you, um, you don't really want to show because you kind of want to protect them. And I think in, in my case, I think the editing, I only show the stuff become their past. It wouldn't <coughs> kind of hinge or affect their nowadays life. Because hmm. it could be quite uh, strange, sensitive, yeah. Did, did they need convincing or was that easy? Uh, with my case, I, I think it's very easy. I don't know why, because I never worked with second person on my side. I was. I was with my own camera. I don't use sound person. So everything's very rough. And my camera's tiny, small, without the sound device at all. So all the sound is quite bad. Um, I couldn't really have other stuff. And I didn't want anyone to help me. So, so I was there, uh, a kind of a, a young woman from China who didn't really understand their life. And it's very much like me, myself, like a, a kind of strange foreigner to them. And they laughed at me. When I began to interview them, they said, what are you doing? Um, uh, how strange, how stupid. Um, yeah. And you're not even from BBC or, or, you know, or some big TV channel. So they, said, they think I'm kind of useless um, for nothing, like try to be an artist. And I told them this is not BBC or big channel. It, it won't sort out their problem. But then in a way, I think it's liberating um, between me and them. Um, just as some person from some other country I should try to understand how they live, which yeah. is we live in the same street, and I live on the, on the, on the building, on the flat, and they live downstairs in the street. Because many interviews are being, you did many interviews in, East, in the East End yeah. in London, and you came, just to give some background about yourself, you came to, to uh, England in 2002 yeah. without speaking English, I understand, yeah. which yeah. was a big yeah. project in itself. In the meantime, you wrote 10 novels, which have been translated in... 29 la seven, languages? Seven, okay. Seven. seven. <laughs> and uh, 10 films? Something like that. I don't, can't. You don't know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I read in, the, in an interview in The Guardian that you'd said that um, you disliked English film school when you came here because it was very practical and it wasn't about discovering your vision. Do you feel that you have discovered more of that in the meantime? Um, I was always in a film school, and I really trained as a filmmaker, but I somehow I never really liked being inside a film school. So I'm kind of you know, a mean student. I treat film school as a renting shop for, for the film equipment. Um, but again, could I be so mean? Um, I think at the same time I felt grateful to the film school because that's the only education I have, um, apart from the middle school education I had. But in a way, I think, it, I think what film school lacks is give you a vision, or you cannot really learn uh, art artistic vision because you have to grow up with it. So I think in the film school it becomes very technical, very purpose-driven. But again, I think I look at my, my own way of uh, expressing more or less, you know, start from poetry, literature, novel. And then I started to make film when I was 20, uh, 30 years old. And before that I was publishing novels. In a way, I think my vision or, or my kind of social concern is really more like a writer or a kind of poet, you know, a kind of a silly intellectual, political intellectual's approach to a subject rather than from a filmmaker's point of view. Mm -hmm. so, so far, I would never understand how to use camera properly. But then I was eager, always eager, want to say some ideas, which nowadays the films doesn't like ideas because it's so commercial nowadays the film, yeah. Um. But still, this is a very cinematic film. I, I mean, hope so. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, you used like this from the poverty because when when you say cinematic, and I think how how poor when I had this, all this footage, and then when I when I found as an editor to do this editing, and the editor always 
appalled, like so angry with this footage. Like, first, the sound is completely in, inaudible, and then the footage has no focus, and everywhere is kind of, in, kind of disconnected. It was so randomly done. And I think it was so painful, always working with editor who couldn't really deal with the mass, uh, the, the kind of low quality footage. But eventually, we managed to make the film. Yeah. Beautiful, yeah. Thank you. Uh, um, I was wondering, some, somewhere in the film, someone talks about collective ex anxiety. I was wondering, was that the sort of energy that started this project also? Because you, you sensed it on the street. Yeah. Or, or um, was it more or also a love of the place, of this specific place, East End, where you have lived for a number of years? Um, I always feel this uh, collective anxiety, which is not individual problem. And I think when I lived in China, this is very clear because in China it's kind of one mono system. Um, the concept of self really barely existed. You know, we live collectively, you know, we have this policy, when child policy, what kind of job, you, what kind of school you are designed to go. So it's kind of nanny state in China. And it's clear that collective problem, collective anxiety, especially when, when Chinese society was transformed the last 20 years, mm -hmm. this anxiety was, the anguishment is really enlarged. And I think that shows in most of the books and the articles and the literature. You, 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 can, you can read that and you can you feel that when you're in China. But in the West, I was told, and I intend to believe it's much more individu individualistic society. So the depression or the problem is more a kind of individual destiny, a personal case rather than a social case. And I, I couldn't really believe that, and I never will, will believe that. And I think it's always come back to the how, how the community, how the society produces the individual. Um, so I think in this film, this is set in London, you know, the capital of the, the capitalism society, um, how it has started as a whole, the whole uh, system um, in the West. And I think I look at the, each, each case, you know, some are from Africa, some from Asia, some some are uh, English. Mm -hmm. um, nearly everybody are immigrant um, in this film, but it shows exactly similar, this anguish and, and this dislocation, this kind of dispossessed um, belonging. Yeah. Um, it's totally, I think, the result of the current society. The economic structure of society. Absolutely, you yeah. Because ex an exile and being in transit is something you personify in a way, it's an, and it comes back in many of yeah. your work. I write about that in the, in the fiction, and I do make comments in, in my film as well, but I think in, in a novel I will do it more subtly or more kind of elusively, because the literature depends on the language. And I think with documentary format, it's just really straightforward. Um, it's there in the street, and all you do, you document it. And even there in the street, this everyday misery, it's, it's barely shown in, in, a, in a TV or in a, in a mm. cinema. A cinema is kind of creamed, pornalized um, fictional format nowadays. There's no reality in cinema. How was the film received? In the, I was, it was shown in, at the London Film Festival, and yeah. because it is part of London, so how was, it res how was the discussion afterwards? Do people recognize this, or did it stir up something? It was quite good. It was premiered in the uh, London Film Festival, and then in Asia was in Busan yeah. uh, Film Festival. Uh, I didn't go to Busan, but I was in London Film Festival. It was in BFI, South Bank. Uh, it was a very good uh, discussion, um, because I think um, people do recognize those streets. Um, these are very famous streets, you know, in Hackney or in front of Liverpool Street Station or somewhere around London Fields, or Victoria Park. Those are like tourist spots. And if you've ever been to London, you would be in those areas. And I think this, I guess people kind of see quite clear the texture of the city um, and the whole class system. So the discussion may be kind of more like from insider's point of view. Um, um, I, would, uh, I would like to discuss more, but this film is really show so far. Hmm. But did they also recognize the, the anxiety that you show that, that uh, seeps through the conversations? Hmm. Um, I mean, it's, uh, it's obvious. It is the, the, the mood, the, the very mood is in the film. And I think, I hope it does affect you, because I want to be influenced, affected by quite dark vision. And I somehow, I want to transform that from these 17 minutes to 
Yeah. The audience, yeah. Yeah. You use this image of the panopticon, uh, this yes. prison. Yes. Uh, is 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 that a sort of a metaphorical image for how capitalism? It's maybe more about control and totalitarianism. Yeah. And I think I mentioned George Orwell before the screening, because I was very affected by that book, um, as much as I was affected by 1984 by Orwell, because I didn't read George Orwell at all when I was living in China. Um, so it was a very big thing for me as a Chinese citizen, grew up in a very communist family. I never read George Orwell until I was 32. Um, and I think that was quite a really big deal for me to, to read 1984, Big Brother, the whole idea. So before that, I, I, I read a little bit of Michel Foucault, um, his article, his, uh, his book about prison system, the madhouse system. And I think I was very much kind of stirred by the idea of how the prison system is. So now you see in the film, these two, three images, actually it's Michel Foucault's analysis of the prison uh, system. And of course, I use that, I think, this character was so um, damaged by the system, mm. and he was, of course, he was prisoner, and he has been a gangster. Um, and he was describing me the, 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 how the system inside the prisoner, or in between the inmates, how this class difference between inmates, and I, I was really quite um, amazed to understand from what he said to me. And I wanted to show this quick image. And it's a pity you, I think you only have two seconds in that film um, to see that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but it struck me also as an image for when, when this man towards the end of the film talks about the, um, you know, the capitalist economy making it impossible for people to, to plan the future. There's a sort of uh, structured instability yeah. that's within the system. Um, that that somehow also keeps people in control because you you can't plan ahead you you know this is this is a way of keeping people still yeah so i thought maybe also it's an image for that but maybe it's too far fetched i don't know so. oh i like your your analyze um anyway <laughs> 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 it's better than mine yeah do do, do you feel a sort of rev through these conversations something revolutionary this is a big word but i mean is the, are people so dissatisfied that they that they can spring into action, or is there more sort of re resignation? Um, revolution, I can't really believe. Um, I can't really believe. Um, although this is sort of happening in Europe, but in a country like Britain, I can't really believe because it's a strong monarchy system. And uh, somehow the class, the class situation is so strong, and people seem more or less just living under this structure. Um, I was in India last month, and I think there's a similar kind of class structure, which in China will be immediately abolished, and uh, there will be cruel, or cruel revolution. And th there was cruel revolution in 1949 to abolish this class system. Um, but the revolution involves massive quantity of cruelty to individual human. So in a place like Europe, so civilized, historically sophisticated, the discussion of human rights is, is not only the social level, but very individual level um, mm -hmm. discussion. And I can't imagine a real revolution could happen in Europe. Yeah. Are there questions from the audience? You, who, who, who saw the film just now? Thank you. Thank you. And Do you want to say something? Don't be shy. Someone, <laughs> someone start. Can you tell us something more about your... Oh, sorry. About uh, your real message and the third part of your trilogy. That uh, my third part of trilogy, I haven't uh, <coughs> really did any work yet. Um, but uh, my, I don't really want to speak too much. But my idea is about children, you know, about tomorrow, about children of the proletarian, the children of the working class in the world. But um, I wouldn't speak too much about it. And sometimes I think the idea for the next project is diluted in my kind of other media, like I, I will write into a novel for some reason and I make other kind of article. And it's kind of become deformed in other format, yeah. But I hope I make this one. Any questions? I can't see everyone. How is the system in China compared mm. to 
England? Mm. It's uh, it's an interesting question. It's like um, it's it's like a social history um, evolution, because before 1949, Mao's communist revolution, the the social class is um, it's kind of simple if I, I compare with the West one, because China has been through these thousands of years of feudal society, so there's an emperor there, and then the rest of people are serving for the emperor. So there's a certain kind of military and an administration, and then the underneath is just this um, a kind of landlord slave system, which we call peasants, landlord peasant system. So the whole big structure of landlord peasants, massive peasants, say 90% peasants and then there's the elite which is belong to the emperor, to the court. So that's been thousand years, and then there were, we, we had a civil war for the last hundred years um, before the 40s. And then until 1949, this revolution happened, which kind of, we smashed the whole feudal system, emperor was gone, but then what, what came after is, it's very, very simple, uh, a social uh, structure. Uh, three types of people, soldiers, peasants, and workers because all the landlord was killed, and um, lots, lots of professors and intellectuals was punished and killed during the Cultural Revolution in the 60s. So what you left is this kind of 75% are the peasants illiterate, and then there's workers who are new people in the cities to build the city, industrial city, to compete with Russia. And then you have soldiers, massive soldiers population. So that was kind of you know, before 1980s. And I think the, the film I made, Once Upon a Time Proletarian, is about after 80s, suddenly this very simple social structure changed again. And then suddenly overnight, a new entrepreneur, billionaire, middleman. For example, we never had a lawyer or agent, say, you know, literature agent or, or performer agent. Suddenly we have all this new job coming up. I, the, for example, the first brand new job is taxi driver. You know. Uh, someone never touched a vehicle in their life, and all they know is how to conduct buffalo. In one night, they had to learn how to drive a car in order to serve in brand new city as migrant in brand new city, which this person would understand nothing of how a street will work, how, il how the traffic light will work. I think that's a film really shows this kind of radical transition from 1980s onwards here, and I think that was the period, I think, the Chinese Industrial Revolution happened within 20 years, tried to match your Western Industrial Revolution, which happened more than 300 years. From Dickens' time, from, from Manchester, you know, from Liverpool, all that time, you have 250 years or 300, 300 years to digest this uh, industrialization. But in China, it's 25 years, which is recent. And that therefore, I think it looks much more cruel, the whole human story, the transition, the loss of identity, especially, couldn't understand where they are and where they should do in life, yeah. Do you think, uh, do you think the class system in Britain is, is cruel also? It's oh, cruel. Oh, yes. Mm. But then, then I, I think I could speak less so maybe acute um, then I would speak about China because uh, I felt very much foreigner, although I live in London for 10 years. And I still try to understand how this works. You know, West London is different from East London, and North London is much kind of cleaner than South London. It's kind of strange, you know, the structure laid out um, and the language they use. For example, the language in my film, everyone speaks English, but 80% I don't really understand. I had to subtitle it because most of them speak Cockney English with such a strong accent. For them, of course, it's, it's uh, life. You know, they lived all their life in East London. But I couldn't understand at all. I think during the interview, I just kind of blind and deaf. I just turned <laughs> on the camera. It was really, and I had to really subtitle during the editing uh, to, for so, me to understand. So you got help with the, with the language? Yeah, absolutely. Funny. <laughs> I get a, a real English to stand by and tell me what they say, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. One, one final question, but I, so you sort of answered it now. I was wondering, do you feel at home now? Because you could also see this film as a way of connecting with uh, the area I, around you. I'm someone never feel anywhere home, really. And I think, I think people fail to acknowledge they don't belong to anywhere because it, it, it sounds like they're, they're a failure of life. But I think if you can acknowledge that, you will come to terms with it. And I think in, in my life, in my entire life, I never feel home anywhere. 
And I lived in Berlin and Hamburg, and I live in Paris and London. I have lived in those cities, and I lived in Beijing and South China. Uh, I always feel very alienated, and I write about it, and I make film about it. Why don't we, why don't we commit we don't feel belong? But of course, you know, lucky if you do feel belong at home. And I guess some people never left their village. They might feel very much belong and attached to their village. But in my case, I always feel drifting alone. We are just a, a passenger in, the, in yeah. our universe, like the end of the film says. And I very much feel like, like that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>